Almighty God bless you and remain with you always, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Salve Regina, This evening we will be meditating upon the first portion of the fifth chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, about 20 verses. It's a, a consistent section altogether focusing on one experience, and that is the exorcism and the healing and curing of the demoniac in the, the Gadarene area across the lake of the Sea of Galilee from um, the main Jewish portion. And uh, it's a very strange passage. It's in all of the three Gospels, the three synoptics, and of course the first time it appeared was here uh, in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's uh, uncanny and uh, very uh, amazing. The act of power through which uh, our Lord Jesus heals and casts out the demons from this man who has suffered so very much. There are a lot of controversies concerning this passage. Even the name of the town where this happened or the, the area of it is a little bit unclear. But it is uh, just amazing. And for people who like to have a kind of a watered down Jesus of made in their own image, this, it's very hard to handle this passage because it's these 20 verses very clearly see and show us the Lord acting with power and majesty, casting out demons. And he certainly has done this earlier in the uh, earlier parts, one of the very earliest portions of the gospel. But this is an extended passage. It's one of the longest in any of the gospels that focuses upon this incident of an encounter between the Lord Jesus and a person who is just totally uh, caught up in the power of evil. Now, as people reflect upon this uh, in, from our modern perspective, they might try to diagnose what is the difficulty with this man. Uh, is it some form of sickness, some form of mental disease or whatever? But what the, the gospel speaks of is uh, possession. And it speaks of the, not only the casting out of a demon, but of a legion of demons. And this is a, uh, an amazing dimension of life, which uh, we're not too attuned to these days. I think C.S. Lewis put it uh, best when he said that uh, the devil is happiest when we don't believe in him at all and when we believe in him too much, when we pay too much attention to him. But certainly there are these uh, incredible powers and forces which uh, are, uh, are very, very troubling and uh, which we need to be attentive to in this world. 
Uh, but whatever the particular state of this man and his great suffering, the reality is he is suffering greatly and he is liberated. At the beginning of this portion, we see him chained up by the people who are trying to protect him from himself and protect others from him. He's violent, he's coming at people. At the end of the gospel, this portion, we see him sitting down, it says, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind. He has been liberated from a great evil. This portion of the gospel is a bit unusual in that it is set in an area which is not part of the Jewish homeland. When our Lord goes across the water, he goes to Gentile territory, the territory of the Decapolis, just across the water. And so really this is one of, maybe it is his first encounter with the Gentiles. And in fact, it's interesting that at the very end of this, as we be attentive to who does he send as the first missionary to the Gentiles? You might think it would be St. Paul perhaps later on when he sends him on that great mission. Distinguished apostle. No, it's not actually. The first missionary to the Gentiles is a man, this man in this gospel, caught up with so much, so terribly afflicted by all the different forces he was dealing with, mysterious and powerful as they were. It is that man who is a raging person, violent at the beginning of this portion, who ends up being sent by the Lord to evangelize. And I think each one of us can be attentive as we reflect upon how we ourselves are healed and cured by the Lord of whatever our own particular afflictions are, that that can be the foundation for a mission to help and to serve other people. I always like it in Psalm 51, which is prayed in the divine office every Friday and morning prayer, that uh, it speaks of free, being freed from our sins so that we can go out to bring the message of God to other people. A healing, a liberation, an exorcism has that beneficent effect and is something that we need to be attentive to. So we will now begin to launch into this powerful and majestic and disturbing passage, one of the most disturbing in all of the Gospels, where after having last month reflected upon our Lord taming the power of nature, in the midst of the storm of the sea. Now he tames the power of a storm more frightening than that in the Sea of Galilee, the storm that was raging in the heart of an afflicted man and brings him peace, shalom, and a new life, new freedom, and a mission to help others to attain that as well. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we ask you to free us from our, our cares and concerns, those things that bind us, chain us, that we may hear your word with open, free hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, help us to let go of those barriers which block the pathway to our hearts, that we may receive you with joy. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Heavenly Father, help us to to meditate upon this passage of your holy word, that we may know what it says to our head to understand you, to our heart to love you, to our hands to serve you. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when he had come out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who lived among the tombs. And no one could bind him any more, even with a chain, 
for he had often been bound with fetters and chains. But the chains he wrenched apart, and the fetters he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him eagerly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them leave. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. And the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there clothed and in his right mind, the man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their neighborhood. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. But he refused and said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all men marveled. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Jesus has been there in the midst of his people. He has been in the synagogue where he begins his ministry, where also he experiences this encounter with, with evil. And he's traveled around among his own people. But they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. He doesn't stay in his own area, his own comfort zone, we might say, but he goes to the other side of the sea. He moves out, reaches out. As our Holy Father, Pope Francis says so often, he goes to the peripheries, to the edges, far away from the temple of Jerusalem. In fact, he will find more welcome in the edges than he will in the temple in Jerusalem. But he goes to the other side of the sea and perhaps despite the shocking reality, the violence, the fear, the slavery that he experiences there, perhaps we need to reflect upon that in our own life. Each one of us as disciples of Jesus, are, are you, am I ready to go to the other side of the sea? Not only, for example, maybe being missionaries in distant countries, but to the other side of the sea. Sometimes it takes a storm to go through that, as it does in the gospel. But we so often kind of, we cling to the shore. In another portion of the gospel, the Lord says, put out into the deep, duke and altum, move out. Not only into the deep to fish in the Sea of Galilee, but in this case, go to the other side of the sea. Reach out to the people who are far away, who are not comfortably caught up in the spirit of God or easily people we can relate to. And he certainly, our Lord doesn't experience that in this encounter. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Big scholarly debate, is it Gadara or Gerasa or Gamera or whatever? Who knows, we haven't a clue. Scholars don't have a clue, that's not a bad idea. Scholars don't have a clue where it is. Some places are 30 miles from the sea. One of these names, that'd be an awful long run for the pigs to get that far and go. So we don't know really where exactly it was, but we do know it was the other side of the sea. It was 
alien territory. Our Holy Fathers very frequently says, you know better to be, you go on the streets, you get injured, you stay in the sacristy, you get sick. Better be injured in the street than sick in the sacristy. And so before we even get into the incredibly dramatic and amazing and very mysterious reality that Jesus found on the other side of the sea, let's just ask the Lord to give us the courage, the adventure, the faith, the hope, and the love to move out of our own comfort zone, as we say these days, to go to the other side of the sea, to places we do not really understand and even know their name. And that doesn't require a long journey physically. Sometimes just a slight turn to someone nearby could be a journey to the other side of the sea. Sometimes just simply somewhere nearby. There's someone we don't really know, but we need to reach out. They're strange, they're alien, they're distant. They're like the Gergesenes, whatever that is. And we need to reach out there and not hold back. So let's ask the Lord to give us courage and faith and hope and love to go to the other side of the sea, whatever that means in our own life. And when he had come out of the boat, there met him what out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, even with a chain. For he had often been bound with fetters and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, and the fetters he broke in pieces. And no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. And when he had come out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. The man is caught up in the unclean. His whole gospel is filled with that. The unclean spirit who afflicts him. The tombs which were ritually unclean to the people on the right side of the tracks or the sea. And the swine, the pigs, which are unclean animals. There's everything out of this uncleanness we see coming the mercy and the love of God. And when he had come out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, even with a chain. For he had often been bound with fetters and chains, for the chains he wrenched apart and the fetters he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Here is someone who is beyond control of the people, even people apparently trying to help him and protect others from him. They do it by binding him more, tying him up. The best they can do is to tie him up and it doesn't work. Whatever it is that afflicts him, whatever powers there are within him, whatever this is, and it's very mysterious and dangerous, he breaks out from that. People we can encounter in this world so often we can treat people with distance as dangerous enemies, aliens, people we cannot relate to except by binding them up. And that's, uh, that's a thing we have to reflect upon in our life. When he had come out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He's coming towards him. So often in the gospels, the people with unclean spirits or the sinners or the unclean, the, those who are rejected, and here is a man truly rejected, living among the tombs, is the worst place. You could never do that. If you were part of the community that gives us, sustains us with love, he's alienated, he's lonely, he's being afflicted by these demons. He's far away. Even to the people of the town, he's distant, not just to those on the other side of the sea. And how they tried to deal with him by tying him up, shutting him off, shutting him down. But the chains he wrenched apart 
and the fetters he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. He's being treated with violence and power as he himself is acting violently and dramatically and ferociously. And we see this in different ways, and here we have one example. We learn later on, he's, we hear of the legion of evil spirits within him. But this can take different shape in our world, in our life. The power of evil, the reality of suffering and of violence. We can see it within the human heart. We can see it in our society. We're in the 100th anniversary this year of that great march towards death that was initiated in June of 1914. And where everything just got worse and worse, violence, hatred, murder, massacre, un, unreal, un, unimaginable. I'm just reading a book called 1913. <laughs> It's about all the happy times in all the different cities of the world. No one had a clue what was going to happen. Sailing along, sort of like, you know, you, you hear someone going down a stream and you hear, what is that roar in the distance as you approach the brim of, uh, of Niagara Falls? <laughs> and so we can sometimes be like cozy tourists on the Titanic, having a drink and looking at the beautiful woodwork. But that world in which we live, there's much, most things we don't control, we don't bind up or take care of this way. It's a dangerous world out there, and even within our own hearts it can be that. It's not tame. It's sort of not... The violent animals that surround us are not animatronic robots. And so we need to be awake to that. And it, it takes different shapes and forms, whether it be war, or whether it be within an individual person, within society, whatever it may be. But here is a sign of it. And however we can delve into the mystery of what this particular person was dealing with and these demons within him, he is to us as well a sign of that chaos that is worse than the storm in the last chapter of Mark's Gospel. Our Lord's miracles are not simply one thing after another. He always uses miracles. We always is present sort of like a, to help us see more. They're signs of something deeper. And they certainly are based upon reality at a certain time in a certain place just across the Sea of Galilee. But they always speak to us more deeply of what is in our own hearts, in our own society. So we always need to apply them and say, what does it say in our own situation? So let's reflect upon that world of violence, the world of contortion, of no peace, no shalom, where the solution is to tie someone up, to make it go away. It doesn't work. Only love works. Violent solutions don't work. And when he had come out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been bound with fetters and chains, with the chains he wrenched apart and the fetters he broke in pieces. And no one had the strength to subdue him. Let's just meditate upon that and reflect upon that in our world and perhaps some experience of untamable violence or evil or suffering or whatever that we can't control and that we must face. And night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out, and bruising himself with stones. Here is this man, 
chained up and he breaks out. But he's not some monster that they're trying to tie up. They think he is, perhaps. That's what they're, how they're trying to handle him. But he's crying out and bruising himself with stones and wandering on the mountains alone. You could imagine them hearing his voice through the night. This man is in agony and affliction. And the solution of his fellow citizens and it's not brought him peace. It's not, they haven't handled him. For his heart is crying out. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out, bruising himself with stones. Let's think of those people we know or whatever situation near or far, of people who perhaps not exactly as this man is doing, but the same fundamental reality, are wandering on the mountains night and day crying out and bruising themselves with stones. Who are these people? Do we see them? Perhaps they're not so dramatic as he is but perhaps they suffer as much. Are there people we do not notice who night and day are wandering on the mountains, crying out and bruising themselves with stones? What do we do? And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And here we see the voice of the spirit within this unclean spirit. And yet we see the man also running to Jesus to worship him. It seems to be that in the gospels, the unclean spirits know Jesus better than the faithful disciples do. They, not like Peter and all the beloved Friends of Jesus are not calling him son of the most high God, but he's recognized. When Jesus passes by, all that is evil recoils and recognizes who it is. And we see as we enter into this time of Lent that lies ahead of us, as we get closer to Holy Week, how that more and more is brought before us. Jesus is not just sort of a friendly little preacher, kind of wandering around giving his feel-good message. This is son of the most high God. He is also Jesus, Yeshua, rescuer. And he's come to rescue this poor man afflicted. And the power of evil recognizes Jesus and who he is much more than the benign good people who do not recognize God, but go through the motions of their faith. It reminds me of a line in Robert Bolt's uh, great novel or great play about uh, Thomas More, A Man for All Seasons, where there's a little dialogue between Thomas More and the Duke of Norfolk, who's a pious, devout Catholic who goes to Mass every Sunday, but is giving in to the king, to evil, evil. And he won't, doesn't see what's happening. And he points out that all the nobles of England have given in to the king, and they have. All the bishops too, except John Fisher. And uh, there's a line, I don't know whether Thomas More ever said it, but he probably did. Sounds like him. And he says to the Duke of Norfolk, 
the nobility of England would have slept through the Sermon on the Mount. And it's true. <laughs> but meanwhile, this is very strange, this encounter between Jesus, the demons, the power of Satan present that is afflicting this man, and the man himself who's bound, not only by the chains, he's got his friends or his supposed friends are chaining him up so he doesn't move around, and he's bound internally. And yet he's reaching out too, he's worshiping. And from within the voice comes, and actually, it sounds like the demon is trying to do an exorcism on Jesus. He says, he says the formula for exorcism here. He, he says, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. This is a crazy mixed up world. It's wild things are happening here that don't fit into our everyday philosophy. It's kind of adventurous being a Christian when you realize the reality of what Jesus is engaged in. And when you see in Paul, for example, speaking about dealing with powers and dominations and great forces which don't fit within our neat little categories. So here we have this satanic voice coming out sort of doing a reverse exorcism on Jesus, and of all nerve, trying to tell Jesus not to torment him. This poor man is being tormented from within and from without. His friends are tying him up and binding him with chains, and internally he's got this horrible affliction of this presence, and the demons have the nerve to say to Jesus, don't torment me. You ever notice how we tend to do that? We don't recognize. It's true in sin as well. This isn't sin, really. It's something a little different. How we, do you notice how we ever, we recognize so well the faults in others that are mostly ours? We project out onto others what actually is what's really in our own heart. Jealous people are very sensitive to how jealous everyone seems to be. Angry people notice all that anger out there. Certainly not in me, of course, but out there. Oh, it's a crooked world we're in. And in the midst of it all, we have the mercy of God coming into this world with this man howling all through the night and bound up by his friends and roaming the mountains and living in the tombs. And, and then we have, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Here for the first time we have a recognition of what's happening. Even, well, it's just like St. James says, you know, the devil has faith and trembles. When we have that battle between the disciples, really, of St. James and St. Paul, you know, saying, it's, is it faith or not works, or is it works, not faith? Well, of course, the answer is, which is it, faith or works? The answer is yes. But in the great line in St. James, it says, even, you say you have faith, even the devil has faith and trembles. So here we have the satanic voice coming out. What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Recognizing him, I adjure you by God. The devil swearing by God. What? Well, yes, of course he is. I remember seeing once a, a, a great little funny little cartoon. Um, it's all about Jesuit discernment about how sometimes the devil appears like an angel. You see a nice snowy field, like a lawn. It's all covered with snow. And there you see someone doing, making an angel in the snow, the way we can do, you know. I haven't done it for a few days anyway, but anyway, you know, making an angel in the snow. And it's the devil making an angel in the snow. Um, so it's all caught up. And it's crooked and strange and dangerous. But it is because Jesus had said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Our Lord is there, Yeshua, the rescuer, to the rescue, wherever he is, releasing, freeing, 
those who are bound in so many different ways, whether it be with, after this, Jairus' daughter, with just a regular sickness and death, regular sickness and death. Before it, he's there freeing the disciples from their fear in the midst of the storm, and here he is dealing with another kind of evil we face in this world. You know, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Take your pick. There we are. We've got to deal with it all. This, uh, as it says nowhere in Scripture, I didn't promise you a rose garden. In the only garden, we have a snake in the grass. So here we are. It's why we call one of the greatest scriptural writings is called the spiritual combat. And a kind of a gooey-gooey Christianity is kind of a little out of touch. It's just not the real thing. And the same with Jesus, a little, you know, this kind of, we project him to make him, a, you would never imagine most, uh, I don't think this passage is a hit in, a, in the, the top passages that are used in the kind of cultural appropriation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to be attentive and we need to li live our faith seriously. I mean, we're dealing with evil. We're dealing with good and evil, the battle of the universe. We're dealing with the whole reality. So we've got to smarten up. We've got to at least recognize Jesus as much as the demon does in the gospel here. We don't have time to fool around. We have a short time on this earth. So a kind of a, a superficial Christianity just doesn't cut it. We just can't, we just don't have time for that. We've got to be engaged Christians, living our faith to the full. And maybe it's good to have this passage, it isn't providential, it's just the way they broke down in the dividing, but just before Lent. This is a good passage to read on Ash Wednesday. Think of it. I always, um, I always use the old Ash Wednesday prayer. You know, there is beautiful one, repent to believe in the gospel. That's, of course, right out of the gospel. But um, I always use, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It tends to concentrate the mind. And this gospel does too. So come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Jesus isn't sort of negotiating. He said, come out of the man. The unclean spirit is negotiating. He's trying to butter up Jesus. And later he says, will you just sort of, will you let me stay here or there or something? Our Lord doesn't bargain with the devil. That's another thing too, you know. We, we shouldn't look at it as a sort of an equal contest or something. This is just a third-rate angel. That's what we're dealing with. But powerful and dangerous, but not God. We are called to respond to God's grace, simply a source of temptation and sometimes of great suffering. But ultimately, Jesus is Lord. Notice how here Jesus serenely calls for the freedom of this poor suffering man who's howling on the mountainside, screaming and hitting himself with stones. And Jesus comes and brings him peace. So let's think of that and take how seriously we realize the stakes of the war in which we are engaged. And let's smarten up. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him eagerly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, send us to the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them leave, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He knows. But he wants the name. The name 
speaks of who we are. We relate to one another that way. What is your name? Moses asks, and God says, I am who I am. We pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We speak of the holy name of Jesus. When I grew up as a little kid, we always, you always tell when people are praying the Hail Mary because their heads are going down regularly. The holy name of Jesus. But this name, what is the name of this? Who sometimes speaks singularly and sometimes in the plural. Legion. And they would have seen Roman legions marching down the road in this part of the world. Powerful force, lots of chains and manacles there. Powerful, many, overwhelming. My name is atom bomb. My name is cruise missile, whatever. 6,000 soldiers, an occupation force marching by. Although this is on the Gentile side of the sea, so it would not have been as looked at as negatively, perhaps, as on the other. His name may be Legion, for we are many. He's puffing himself up. We are many. But he knows the game is up. And he begged him eagerly not to send them out of the country. So now the devils or the demons are negotiating with Jesus. They know they're going to leave this poor man. It's, the game is over and the jig is up. But they still want to linger around a bit. Sort of like the residual force of evil that we face ourselves day by day in different forms than this. You don't get rid of evil that easily. Even in the more profound reality of sin, which this is not. This is a different thing. We're freed completely of sin at our baptism and in that extension of baptism, which is the sacrament of reconciliation. But we can't, we're not just sort of home free. It's a struggle in which we are purified. And uh, it's a great thing in early on in the God, book of Genesis talks about how, you know, the devil and evil is sort of at the door, crouching at the door. And all of our temptations to pride, anger, envy, greed, laziness, lust, and gluttony are at the door of the confessional waiting to pounce because they're within our hearts too. So neither the world, the flesh, nor the devil are likely to leave this country. So let's, we're in it for the long haul, everyone. Life is a marathon, it's not a sprint. We get that clear, we're on our way. Life is spiritual combat. I highly recommend the book by Lorenzo Scupoli, Spiritual Combat. This isn't like silly games we're dealing with here. And too often we look upon our faith as no more than that. Take it lightly. And don't give it enough serious reflection. It's just like in a different way. I remember Father Barron very wisely saying that he talks about his niece who in, in, in high school, I think it's in high school, who for literature is reading Hamlet for physics is reading Einstein, and for religion is reading comic books. We, should, we don't dumb down the faith. And so he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many, and he begged him eagerly not to send them out of the country. And now we have this weird event, <laughs> which makes people wonder, this is what is going on here? And I don't think anyone really quite knows what is going on here. The people who are kind of cannot uh, abide the reality of demonic possession say that the man was waving his hands around and it scared the pigs. Off they went, galloping down the hill. That's a kind of a naturalistic solution to this. 
sort of similar to our Lord walked in the water because he knew where the rocks were. You know, this, you get, people can think up almost anything. Or the, the loaves and the fishes is the sort of a, a miracle of charity because everyone pulled out their extra loaf out of their whatever. You know, that's not what they're talking about here, but whatever it is, and I think we could get a little worried that what, what harm do poor pigs do, but I don't think that's quite the point here. It's just like, you know, just like the good, you know, the good shepherd, if you want to push it too far, the good shepherd ultimately either fleeces the sheep or eats them. But I hate, I hope I haven't ruined the image of the good shepherd for everyone, but this is, we, some things you just don't push because it's not the point. This is, like swine, for one thing, certainly to the Jewish tradition, would not be, uh, are, are unclean, like the tombs and like the evil spirits this poor man is suffering. So this is, there they are. We're obviously in Gentile country. And I think that probably the, in the more in the Jewish dimension of, as this was being prepared and read later on, they would say, ah, that's appropriate. Send us into the swine. Isn't that, here we have these glorious demons flaunting their power. And the best they can do is get into the unclean swine. There's, a, I'd hate to say, not exactly a joke here. This is not, nothing, this is not a jokey kind of thing, but there's a certain grim humor here that legion, mighty Roman legion, begs to be allowed to go into a pig. And sure enough, off they go into the sea, just as the sea swallowed up Pharaoh and all his forces, the sea that is this place of chaos, destruction, and sometimes purification, as in Noah and um, Noah's Ark, the flood, and the rainbow that is a sign of a new covenant, the purification of the world from evil, the sign of hope, the sign of a new covenant. And the sea we have just seen, just the last passage is also a place of danger. Whatever it is, off they go. And all of this evil is sucked out and off into the sea. Gone. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. That reminds us of Pharaoh. You know, uh, at the Easter vigil, we have that song of Miriam, horse and rider, he is cast into the sea. This one portion where we actually have everyone, we have the singing of that little passage. That, that passage is sort of a reading, actually, but it's sung as a kind of a song. It's Miriam's great song. And actually, there's a beautiful stained glass window of Miriam dancing in, the, in this cathedral. So gone. Let's just thank the Lord for, oh, I don't know, the times we face, whatever it may be, this away, away with it all. All these things where the Lord draws out of us whatever it may be that is afflicting us. And I don't think any of us have faced what is described here with such power, but we all do in different ways. All cast into the sea. Lord, take whatever it is that is afflicting me of whatever kind and throw it into the sea, gone. We can even ourselves take things in our own lives and just say, Lord, here it is, cast it into the sea. Jesus, Jesus, come to me from all my sins, oh, set me free. And the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. Curiosity. <laughs> what? He did what? And they came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. He's free. This is the one they, their solution was tie him up with chains. As he's wandering, the poor man, now he's sitting, he's at peace. 
He's not wandering in the mountains anymore. He's sitting down and clothed before he was naked. And clothing is a sign of dignity. Clothing is a sign of the, certainly in the apocalypse, of our behavior. We don't want to have stained garments. In fact, our garments have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. If you think of it, it's difficult to think, but there it is, through our baptism. And he's clothed, and he's in his right mind. The gift of reason, which is that great gift, has been returned to him. the man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their neighborhood. That's the understatement of the whole gospel. They began to beg Jesus to depart from their neighborhood. Well, partly you could say because of all the losing, all the, but I think it's more than that. It's too often we beg Jesus to depart from our neighborhood. We can't handle his presence. The tame Jesus that we make ourselves, we can handle because we just put him in a little container. And he gives us the consolation. He feeds back to us what we want to have, what we want to hear. But the real one is untamable. And too often you and I beg him to leave the neighborhood. But he's, we should ask him to stay around. <laughs> Uncomfortable though his real presence may be. And as he was getting into the boat, so now he began by getting out of the boat. Now he's getting back into the boat. He just is passing through. And he's going back to the other side of the sea where his main mission will be. But he's brought liberation here to this distant place. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might go with him. This is the response. He knows he's free. Now he wants this man who had brought him mercy and love and and he could probably hear the voice being through him saying, Jesus, Son of the Most High. He wants to be with Jesus. Whenever we experience the liberation from the liberator, we want to be with him. We don't want him to go away. He begs him to take him with him. But Jesus refuses. Because he has a greater mission for him. And he says, go home to your friends. What a beautiful thing. This poor man has been howling on the mountaintops. And Jesus says, go home to your friends. He's now back among his friends again. And tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Maybe we should make that the final words of the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. Maybe those should be the last words of Mass. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. That's the message. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, in Gentile territory, how much Jesus had done for him. And all men marveled. Wow, amazing how much God had done and how he'd had mercy upon this poor lonely man who had been so afflicted in so many ways and isolated and hurt and bound and enslaved. Now he's experienced freedom, liberation, love, mercy, because Jesus visited him, passed through the neighborhood, which the people don't want Jesus to be in, and brought him mercy. Now he passes it on. As he is called to do, so too are we. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when he had come out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who lived among the tombs. And no one could bind him any more, even with a chain. For he had often been bound with fetters and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart 
and the fetters he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him eagerly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, Send us to the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them leave. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. And the herdsmen fled and told in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the man who had had the legion. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their neighborhood. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. But he refused and said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all men marveled. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.